Um, I've, so in the last year, um, I've had two clients who have killed themselves. Um, Whoa. One was a brand new client who I didn't know very well. I'd only talked to him once, um, but the other was a guy I'd worked with for quite a while and I knew him very well. Um, so it's, it is, it's emotionally hard, <laughs> um, but it's, it, it gives me a lot of hope too, um, because it's amazing to see how resilient the human brain is and how resilient people are, because you said it so well, we live in a, we're humans in a world that doesn't let us be human. And I, I think the reason so many men are pushed to that point by divorce is because they've been taught since they were little kids that their emotions aren't valid. Right? And just like, think about what we do to kids all the time. If they get angry, we put them in timeout. And what is the message that the child gets? Well, I feel angry, that came up in me. And you told me it's not appropriate and I can't be part of your society again until I can control this anger. Mm -hmm. So it's natural to me, and it is, right? Anger happens when we feel threatened and we need to fight back. So anger is a natural response in me, but you've just told me that it's not acceptable and it can't exist here. So the message a child learns is that I'm not acceptable. I'm not okay the way I am. I have to be different to be here, to be you know, part of our society. And I think men especially learn that because men's anger tends to scare us. And so we reject it. But their anger is a manifestation of their fear. They wouldn't be angry if they didn't feel threatened in some way. And when we reject the anger, we're not just rejecting the feeling, we're rejecting the person. And so I think a lot of men learn to stifle and control and suppress a lot of what they feel. Then they go through this divorce and maybe it's been 10 years or 20 or 30 years with this person and their whole identity and their life and their future was wrapped up in it. And so all of a sudden they're having such intense emotion that they can't suppress it. There's nowhere to shove it down to, but they have no tools for dealing with it because every time they got upset or hurt or, and we do it to men with sadness too, you cry, well, don't be a girl, don't be a sissy. Right. So they don't have any tools for dealing with emotions. And now they're so intense, that there's no stuffing them down. And so I think the depression and the suicidal thoughts are actually their brain's way of trying to protect them because they don't have a better way to deal with the emotional pain. So the brain's like, okay, well, let's just numb everything. And that's depression. Let's just not feel anything. It's part of a um, freeze state right? that comes after we go through fight or flight. If we can't fight back and we can't get away, we shut down. And I think that's where the depression is. And the suicidal thoughts are just, this is too much, it's too painful. Maybe this is a way for it to finally stop. Um, so I, I understand it and I understand why they're there. And what gives me a lot of hope is that understanding in that way gives us possibilities because it's, it's not a, I don't see it as a mental illness or even a problem. You know, suicide's a solution to a problem. The problem's the emotional pain. And so to help the people that are in that state, what we need to do is give them better tools for handling the pain and making the pain go away. And if we can do that, then the depression and the suicidal thoughts tend to resolve themselves. Um, so it's hard, but it's, um, there's, I have a lot of hope with it. It's a very, for me, it's also a very personal issue. I haven't dealt with depression or suicidal thoughts, but a lot of the men in my life have. Um, and seeing them struggle and not knowing how to help has always been really hard for me. So it's still hard to do it with my clients, but at least I have the ability to help now. And that's, that's really empowering. And I, I do really enjoy that aspect of it. What, what are the, what are the conversations like when you speak with, speak to a, um, a person who, um, who committed suicide? Like, what are the conversations like before they actually do it? Oof. Um, so my sample size, honestly, is very small. Um, but I have, I am part of a clinician's um, support group for clinicians who've lost clients. And I've talked to a lot of people. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I can get, I could tell you a little bit about my experiences, Darren, but it varies so much. And that's, I've really been educating myself about suicide um, because I think there's a lot, well, there's a ton I didn't know. 
And it's so complicated. You know, some people will be talking about it and getting help and seeking support and you'll think they're okay and then they die. Other people won't say a word. You won't even know they were suicidal and they die. Um, and one of the support groups that I'm a part of, they've really been on a campaign to, to change the narrative around suicide, to just say that suicide is complicated uh, because it is it's very complicated and very different person to person. Um, one of the men that I was working with, I, I probably will never know what happened, but he was uh, he was working with me. He was seeing a psychiatrist. He was um, starting new therapy. He was re he had told his family what was going on with his his brain, um, and he was getting help from a lot of different places. I think one thing that does happen, and I don't know if this is what happened for him. It might have been. It might not have been. But it's something I learned afterwards, and I, I wish I had known before, is that a lot of men going through this will go into anti-anxiety medications to help them sleep. And there's a certain class, and I can't remember which ones they are right now, um, but there's a certain class of anti-anxiety medications that reacts very strongly with alcohol. And if you drink while you're on that medication, it really releases all your inhibitions pretty powerfully. And what the research on suicide and with people that have survived suicide attempts shows is that if you if you have like the urge, not just the thought, but like the desire to do it now, if you survive the first five minutes, something like eighty or ninety percent of people live, because it is this you're in a you're in a moment of acute pain, and it's like I have to end it, I, it has to stop, and it comes up as a sudden intensity, but it passes. But if you have access to a gun, and if you're a man, because men are more likely to kill themselves with firearms than women are, and guns are more likely to work the first time than overdosing or, or other ways of killing yourself. So if you have that moment um, of that sudden urge and you've been mixing an anti-anxiety medication with alcohol, so your inhibitions, your ability to block that urge is reduced and you have the lethal means right there, um, there are a lot of men who are actively getting help, working to get better, getting the sport and tools, and they die because in that moment, there was that combination of drugs and alcohol, and they had access to a firearm. Um, and so learning that, one of the things that I'm starting to incorporate into my practice is education and planning. You know, I'm trying to talk more about suicide and let people know that because you know, who knows? Maybe that's not what happened with this client. It might have been. If it was and he had known that, he could have taken measures like, okay, well, these thoughts are active. I'm on this medication. I'm going to lock my gun up so it takes me at least five minutes to get to it or give it to a friend. Or mm -hmm. like, There's little things that, that make a huge difference because the studies suggest that most people who die by suicide didn't really want to die. They were just in a moment of overwhelming pain. And in that moment, they decided to try to do something about it. Um, so yeah, we could talk about suicide a lot. It's a, it's complicated and it's hard, but there's, we're learning a lot about it. And I think we have a lot of tools to help people who are feeling that way, um, that we maybe didn't have 10 or 20 years ago.